Anyway, we are in Covent Garden and it's um, still fairly busy. It's, it's late, it's 11 p.m., but you still have quite a few people on the streets. And before we go much further, let me show you the Bridge of Aspirations. So this lovely little bridge here, it is art as well as architecture. And on the left inside, you've got the Royal School of Ballet. And on the right inside, it leads to the, the Royal Opera House. And every graduation, uh, a few uh, talented winners, they get a job as a dancer at, as the, uh, at the Royal School of, at the Royal Opera House. So that's why it is called the Bridge of Aspiration, because it, uh, it leads into, uh, into their careers, really. And uh, let's go and take a look at Covent Garden Station. So the station itself, it's quite, uh, it's one of those iconic stations. Usually when you see those, um, those uh, burgundy uh, or terracotta, dark terracotta um, um, tiles, um, shiny, it's quite, uh, uh, quite um, significant of the style of um, Leslie Green. Uh, a lot of the stations on the Piccadilly, they, they look like this, the Piccadilly line. And this one here, it's actually, if you, if you are visiting London, visiting London and you, let's, you say you want to you wanna go from, let's say, Leicester Square to Covent Garden, there's no need to use the underground. It's actually the shortest distance on the, on the line. So it's actually quicker to walk from Leicester Square to Covent Garden than taking the underground. And if you did take the underground anyway, whatever happens, do not take the stairs on your way out. Because, you know, sometimes you don't want to wait for the lift and you're like, oh, I'll take the stairs. But you cannot see the top, so you don't know how many steps. It's 193. So unless you really, uh, really need a lot of exercise, don't do it. Wait for the lift. I've done that mistake once and, uh, and I'll regret it. There's a worker up there. That's probably quite scary. Anyway, the station is hunted. The story here started in, um, in 1955 on Christmas Eve. No one, no, no one really wants to stay very late on Christmas Eve, right? The, um, oh, the, that's a flying truck. Look, it's not touching the floor. Um, so yeah, Jack Hayden, he was a ticket inspector. He was working at the station. He was about to close. And uh, he, um, well, he's in the office and um, which station has the old spir spiral uh, metal staircase, Don is asking. Metal, I'm not sure. The one here is not that old, it's uh, 1907, I think the station was open, so it's not one of the oldest. I'm not sure which one you're talking about with the metal staircase. Um, so yeah, Jack heard a noise and he believed it was a customer that he might have, you know, uh, locked in the station. That happened, uh, that happened a lot, you know. So he opened the door, faced the, the gentleman. It was a gentleman in a grey coat with a, a top hat, like a Victorian top hat. The gentleman stared at him for a few moments and then vanished into thin air. Of course, Jack was petrified and he quickly closed up the station and went home. And after Christmas, he told all his colleagues what had happened. And it turned up that quite a few of them had had some weird sightings as well. And after that day, there were a, a, a ridiculous amount of, of sightings. And some people did not want to work at the station anymore. They asked to be, to be transferred. So that was, of course, a bit of an issue for the, the station manager because they needed staff. And one night they saw the ghost again, so they called Leicester Square Station, where one of the, um, the employees happened to be a, a medium as well, a, a spiritualist. So he came here to do a seance. They, uh, they, uh, they did a little seance. The, the, the medium came up with four letters, T, E, double R. And he also do a little, he drew a little sketch of the, of the ghost. And the employees that had seen the ghost, they were like, yeah, yeah, that's definitely him. And they then looked into, um, into the, you know, whoever that might be. And they came up with a portrait of a Victorian actor, William Terrace. And they were like, yeah, that's the man. So William Terrace, we'll talk about him uh, 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 a little bit more in a while because the station is not the only place that is uh, hunting. Um, but he was a Victorian actor. 
he was murdered not far from here. And as you can see straight ahead, they are installing the Christmas light. It's Halloween! We are in October! <laughs> we'll see the Christmas trees already there on the new bell. They have a new um, design this year, so that's quite cool. So that's quite cool to witness that. But it's Halloween! <laughs> anyway, um, to tell you a bit more about the, the history of Covent Garden itself, it used to be a garden. They used to grow fruit and vegetables to feed the, uh, the, the monks of the, the, the Church of St. Peter's that you might know under the name of the Abbey of Westminster. And uh, uh, already at the time when they had a bit of surplus, they used to sell it. This is the Apple store, Apple as Macbook or phones. Or, but it's quite ironic because that was the, the spot where they used to sell apples when this was a, a fruit market. So yeah, the, um, they used to feed the monks and you might know what happened um, in, in Tudor times. Um, Henry VIII, he famously broke up with the Catholic Church to be able to grant himself uh, a divorce. And um, when he did that, he confiscated all the land that belonged to the church. So that included, of course, the land here that was um, a garden. And the, uh, he gifted it to a mate of his, the, the, the Earl of Russell, um, the, the, the So that's the, uh, the lovely bells. Those are new. Last year it was a different, uh, different deco. It's beautiful, but I would have preferred it in a few weeks. <laughs> I was happy with pum pumpkins for tonight and, uh, and ghosts and vampires. Not Christmas yet. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the Earl of, 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 of Bedford, he, um, he developed the area in a way, it was one of the first uh, Inigo Jones, one of the best. At the time, those very large buildings could not be divided into separate flats, so it was for the rich. Until, of course, we had the, uh, the Civil War, you know, when we beheaded the king. and. Uh, well, it was not a great time for the nobles to be in London, so some of them left for a few, for a few months. So they kind of deserted the area. And then the Russell family did, needed another way to, to make money, so they created a market here. And because there was a market, well, there were a lot of uh, working class people that came to work, you know, and because all those workers were here, the last nobles that were still around they did not want to stay. They moved out to Leicester Square or Russell Square. And th this became more of a, a, a working class area. And then a lot of uh, prostitutes and, and flower girls as well. So this is the famous uh, 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 Covent Garden uh, tree. Usually we don't see it uh, quite, yet, quite yet. I mean, not without the lights. It's the same farm. Um, it's in the West Midlands. It supplies the, the, the trees that uh, decorate Buckingham Palace as well. So it's um, the, same, the same farm. 55 feet high, I think it is. And it's going to soon be covered by 30,000 lights. And... Um, and... Uh, yeah, no, it should be Halloween, then it should be bonfire night, and then Christmas. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, it's getting, it's coming um, earlier on every, earlier every year. The, the actual lighting, I think it's meant to be on the 7th, and then the rest of London, it's the 11th, I think. So it's, they're setting up, but it's not going to be lit up quite yet. So yeah, flower girls, you had a lot of those flower girls here. They used to try to, to sell flowers to the gentlemen. Um, and they'll be like, oh, buy a flower of a poor girl that might ring a bell. It's the, um, the, the, the beginning of Pygmalion, you know, my fair lady, um, Eliza, uh, Doolittle. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, they got uh, inspired by um, the Covent Garden uh, uh, flower girls. Now, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to try not to be too loud because there's a lot of... Um, uh, uh, homeless is gentlemen sleeping here, but let me show you a little hidden gem on the wall. So 
So that's the site of the first uh, Punch and Judy show. There's a pub up there called the Punch and Judy as well. And uh, the, the church behind me, so this is St. Paul's Church, not to be confused with St. Paul's Cathedral. St. Paul's Church is also known as the Actors Church, because a lot of actors are buried in there. And it's also known because they've got some cats. They, had, uh, they used to have two cats that were called Inigo and Jones, like the architect that designed the, pia the piazza. And uh, they died just before COVID. So now they have two new cats and they call them um, Eliza and Mrs. Higgins uh, after, uh, after the play. And apparently the cats at the beginning, they didn't like each other, like the characters. So that's quite cool. And sadly, this church was um, uh, very often uh, uh, in front of the church you'd, at the time, you know, in the, um, in the 18th century, you found a, a lot of babies dropped in, in front of the church because there were so many prostitutes around here that sadly there were a lot of unwanted pregnancies. If you see the burial records of the graveyard at the back, you see a lot of dropped baby, dropped baby, dropped baby. So that's a bit sad. I'm gonna, just so you know, on this street here, sometimes there's a little signal drop. So I'm gonna try not to say anything massively exciting on this street here, in case you lose me for a sec or two. Talking about the graveyard at the back, um, today it's a lovely little garden. You don't really see the graves anymore. So if you happen to have any street food or anything, you can go into the graveyard to, uh, to enjoy it. And they have a little, um, they have a little, uh, 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 a little blue hut looking the size of a, the size of a telephone box really uh, most people don't actually know what it is but that was for the night watch at the time of course when we had a lot of body snatchers now i don't think i need to explain the body snatchers anymore in, in my tours but we never know we might have some newbies so for the ones that don't know the body snatchers they were those people that were going to steal the newly buried bodies from the um from the uh, uh the graveyards for the the anatomy lessons because at the time the only people that were um uh, dissected were the people from the executions they were not enough so we had those uh, um, grave robbers going to steal the bodies and in covent garden we had um uh, well, not really in Covent Garden, but in Leicester Square, we had two, uh, two uh, illegal uh, dissection uh, schools. So it's not far, so that was quite convenient to come and take the bodies from here. And the little, it's quite cool to see that the little hut still stands. Now it's, it's being used as a little cabinet for the cleaners, but yeah. Anyway, now we should be safe from here with the, the signal. We had... Um, we are talking about, uh, 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 about ghosts earlier. Well, we had a ghost on this street as well. One day in the 30s, um, there was a young man walking around here when he spotted a guy with a grey coat and a, a Victorian top hat looking very much like out of style. And he was going to say to him, hey, what are you wearing, mate? And the minute he said he was going to say that, the, the guy vanished. He just disappeared, vanished into thin air. And um, later he was, uh, he was shown a photo of William Terrace and he was like, yeah, that's the man. So Terrace is not only hunting the, the station, he's also hunting the streets and the Adelphi Theatre that we'll see in a moment. We don't really know why he would be hunting the station because the station wasn't there yet at the time he passed. But there used to be a little bakery that he was quite fond of. So it is possible that um, Terrace is basically coming back to his favorite baker. Who knows? So William Terrace was a Victorian actor, very popular at the time, extremely popular. We could say like the, uh, the Hugh Grant of the time. He was in his 50s. He had had a, a, a great career uh, and uh, he had been, you know, Robin Hood or, 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 or Shakespeare's plays as well. And, and one night he was arriving at the Adelphi, so we are here at the back, we are on the, 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 the stage door, really. And uh, he was here with his, uh, with his uh, colleague, when he, he was looking for his keys, so he kind of bent down a little bit to look for the keys, 
when someone came from behind him and stabbed him at the back. The other guy didn't quite realize straight away what happened because it kind of looked like, like a gentle tap in, your, in the back, you know. So he was stabbed twice in his back. Then he, he turned around to face his attacker. And the terrible thing is the attacker was a gentleman he knew. It's, uh, I'm going to try to show you the text here, but I don't know if you'll be able, you'll be able to read. Um, so he, he saw his attacker. That was a chap called Arthur Prince, which was another actor. And he had time to say, I am stabbed, arrest him. Then he was, uh, he was taken upstairs. He did not die straight away. He was taken to his um, um, uh, uh, changing room upstairs. And apparently, well, according to his daughter at least, the last thing he said before to pass was, I'll be back. And he has indeed been back. Um, the, uh, the, the theater itself is meant to be, uh, to be hunted. Let me show you this little alleyway, Bulls in Court. There's a little pub at the back called the, ne the Nell Green. We're not going to go because the signal cool dropper, it's a cute little pub. Hunted as well, they all are. <laughs> it's, sometimes it's probably a bit of a marketing thing as well to have a ghost. And this is Rules. Um, it's the, uh, the oldest restaurant in London. 1798. We have a lot of old pubs and restaurants, uh, old pubs and taverns, but in terms of restaurants, this is the, uh, the, uh, the oldest one. And apparently, it, it, it's been, um, over all those years, they had only three different owners, because it stayed in the same family for ages. It was used as a filming location for James Bond, Downton Abbey, three episodes apparently, so quite a cool restaurant. But anyway, back to Terry's, I didn't tell you the latest ghost. There, there was in the theater um, the, uh, a lady that uh, was just chilling in her, in her resting room when she, um, she heard a, a knock at the door, a, a weird double slow knock, like tuk, tuk. She didn't answer it because she was trying to take a little nap before the play. And, and uh, then she was on, on, her, on her bed or some kind of a sofa. I don't think ever, they have a, an actual bed in there. And um, she felt a weird, cold embrace. And later on, she found out that this changing room or dressing room used to be the room of uh, an actress called Jessie Millhood. She was the, um, she was, uh, the mistress of Terrace. Why is there a Canadian flag? It's a, it's a Canadian bar. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's quite cool. I've been there with uh, Patrick Toomey, the, the guide in, in, in Banff. And um, so, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, not only the room was the, the, the room that uh, um, terrorist mistresses used to use, but apparently, because of course they were secretly together, they were not married. He had to be discreet when he was coming to, to, to visit his mistress. So apparently, to let, to let her know that it was him coming in, he used to do a, a very slow double knock on the door, like, tuck, tuck. So, you know, there's one more little detail that's quite creepy. Um, apparently, when he, when he passed, the minute he passed, I don't remember what was it, what time it was. I think 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. The um, at home where he lived with his son and his uh, his wife and his dog, the dog suddenly started barking like crazy, and his wife was like, "What does he see? What does he see?" At the very exact same timing at which um, uh, William passed away. So yeah, and it was a big deal when he died. Even Queen Victoria, she sent a letter of of uh, condolences to, to the family for losing such a great uh, actor. And talking about acting, um, you know, we are in the area of the theatres. There's a lot of theatres around here. And you'd have to know that if you talk about the history of acting, actor, being an actor was not, especially an actress, was not always a great job, especially for ladies. Well, ladies were only... Um, they, they only came into acting in the 1600s. Before that, there were no ladies on stage. You'd go and see uh, Shakespeare's, you know, like Romeo and Juliet. Juliet was going to be a transvestile. There were no ladies on stage because they, they couldn't read anyway. Neither could uh, um, 
uh, uh, Nell Gwyn, you know, the one that has a pub named after her. Uh, she was Nell Gwyn, she was an amazing uh, uh, actress, but she couldn't read, so someone had to tell her her lines for them, for her to, to, to learn them. She, um, her mother used to have a brothel, so Nell very proudly worked at the brothel. For the ones that don't know, Nell Gwyn was um, uh, uh, one of the famous mistresses of uh, Charles II. He had many, but Nell was one of them. And uh, at the time, you know, the theatres were not like, like they are today. You know, today you take your seat, you sit quietly, you, you laugh and you applaud, but that's it. At the time, people were wild. They'll be drunk, they'll go to the theatre, but people in there were the attraction as much as the play, you know. You'd go to the theatre to see Charles II flirting with Nell. It was like the reality TV of the day, you know. And in the pit in the middle, I mean, if you stood there, you might be urinated up against, you might be spat on. It was wild. And the, uh, you love Nell, so do I. Uh, and at the time, the the, the, you could pay a few pennies to go into the back room to see the actresses uh, changing. So, yeah, not a great job. It was hardly any better than being a lady of the night, to be honest. And you'd have to be almost like a stand-up comedian today. You'd have to be very good, very witty. Nell definitely was. Because the actors would, um, they'll be heckled, you know, people used to, even in a play, you know, people would uh, scream at them or, or, or even sometimes climb on stage. So you'd have to uh, put them down, really. And uh, Nell was famously very witty. There's a few occasions, like once she was in a, in a horse carriage leaving Covent Garden, going back to her place, when suddenly she's surrounded by, by people with, they're just hitting the carriage and they're shouting at her because they knew she was the mistress of the king. But they were confused about which one. Because at the time, Catholics were not very popular and the king also had a, a Catholic mistress. So they were shouting at her and she famously opened the door and she said something uh, uh, along those lines. Oh, I pray for you, my dear people. I'm the Protestant whore, you're mistaken. Um, and uh, she was also, uh, uh, she famously called, so she had a son and she was annoyed with Charles, of course, with the king. She was annoyed that he was not given a, a, a dukedom yet. So one day the king had come to visit his, uh, his little son and uh, the little boy, a toddler, is running away. And Nell said, oh, come here, you little bastard. And the king was shocked. He was like, how dare you call him a bastard? And Nell said, well, as far as I'm aware, you've not given him any titles yet. So that's exactly what he is. And that's how Charles II created the Dukedom of St. Albans. So a title we still, uh, we still have today. So yeah, very funny, very witty. The, those uh, ladies of the night, there were a lot of them here because some of those coffee houses here, they, they used to, you know, coffee houses at the time, you had uh, coffee, of course, but you had alcohol as well, and often ladies of the night upstairs. They were, the square was known as the Square of Venus, because it was such a, 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 an important business here. There is a book uh, from a pimp called The Harry's List. It's a, an interesting read. It's basically um, listing all the sex workers in the area, what they look like, what they do, how much they charge, what they don't do. And that very book has um, inspired Halle Rubenthal, the, the author, um, writing uh, The Covent Garden Ladies. And that very book has inspired uh, Harlots, the, the BBC show. So um, it, was the, it was the place to be at the time if you, wanted, uh, if you wanted a bit of love. And also, it was very dangerous here. At the time, it was full of pickpockets. You'd have to know that, you know, in the, uh, at, uh, in the, the 18th centuries, we didn't have all those lights everywhere. You know, it was very dark. Often, if you wanted to go all the way to the theater, you'd pay a little boy. They had those little boys with a, a, a lantern and they'll take you to wherever you want to, to, to be taken. And um, if you didn't have those, those little boys, or even if you did, you might be pickpocket. Um, and actually, there was so much of a need for policing here that they created, I'm gonna go down this way because that's a bit noisy, they created the Bow Street Runners. And uh, uh, so that's one of the early police forces on Bow Street. So that's the street uh, to, the, to the left here. It is now a museum, so it's quite cool. You can, uh, you can go inside and, um, 
and see the old uh, uh, police station. Oop. There we go. And the uh, the Royal Opera House. It used to be at the um, at the uh, the Ray Lane Theatre. We had had. I'll show you the sign up there. So this is the Royal Opera House. We have had the case of a lady that um, died out of laughter. Her name was Miss Fitzherbert. She uh, she came to see a show at the um, at the, the the Royal Opera House, and she. Well, you know, at the time you had a lot of those uh, um, uh, transgender uh, uh, characters, you know, or tra uh, not transgender, uh, more like transvestile, you know, the actors dressed up as ladies or the other way around. And in that play, in uh, uh, 1782, I think it was, there was uh, um, a gentleman dressed up as a lady. The play was called The Beggar's Opera. And that character, that gentleman dressed up as a girl, was so hilarious. She could not stop laughing. She was laughing her head off. Um, well, quite literally there. She was laughing and laughing and she had to be taken out of, the, of, the, of, of the, the, the place because she just couldn't stop laughing. Cross Dessa, exactly. That's the one, that, the term I was looking for, uh, Natasha. And she, well, she was just laughing, she couldn't stop, so they, they took her home. And even once she got home, she was still laughing and laughing and laughing. And she died two days later. So according to the science magazines at the time, she died out of laughter. Which, if you ask me, it's quite a good way to go. And, and it, it is very much uh, possible because the, um, uh, you know, laughing at the end of the day, it is exercising, so you can they probably have a heart attack, you know, like any other exercise. So, yeah, that's how you want to go, Tish. Well, I agree. It's, it's one of the best ways to go, really. There, there, there have been quite a few cases in history of people that died out of laughter. Anyway, this is the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. It's one of the oldest running theatres in, in the world, really. This, not the building itself. We had uh, uh, three or four different buildings, really. Uh, it burned down a couple of times. At the time, you know, they were quite um, obsessed with, with fire. They were very scared of fires in the theater. But you'd have to remember that they didn't have electricity yet. So they were using those gas lamps. Uh, and um, that was quite dangerous, especially with that many people inside. And. Um, and by the way, they had those. Uh, uh, they had they had been experimenting here with big blocks of lime. When you burn a, a big block of lime, it creates a very white, a very very white and powerful light. Well, that's how we got the expression to be in the limelight. Um, and uh, Greek Stoic died uh, died laughing. I don't know who that is, but. Good to know. <laughs> anyway, that's the, the Novello Theatre. That's where they play Mamma Mia, straight ahead there. And the, um, so the Drury Lane uh, uh, Theatre is also very much uh, haunted. And you might have noticed, we do take our ghost story quite seriously in the UK. So seriously, actually, that if you go on um, Wikipedia and you type down Theatre Royal Drury Lane, um, you've, you know, on Wikipedia, you've got those different uh, sections like history, location, uh, sources. Well, uh, for the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, you've got history, location, huntings. So they've got their own section there. Th there are a couple of ghosts. One of them is only hunting from nine to six. So the, 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 the performers do see him when they rehearse, but the, the audience don't see much of it apart from Sundays when they do the, the matinee. And uh, one of the ghosts, we don't know for sure if it's the same one, is wearing a, like one of those uh, tricorn uh, hats, you know, the um, old style, uh, style hats. It could be the ghost of an actor. There was a murder in the theater, uh, uh, an actor that, that stabbed another actor. So that could be, uh, that could be the one. Some even said that at some point they did some refurbishment and they found, hold on, I need to cross, they found a little, like a mini bricked up room um, uh, and, uh, and in there, they were, uh, there there was a skeleton with a dagger in its chest. So whoever that is, we don't know. 
that could also be our ghost. Who knows? And uh, let me see. I don't know whether you'll be able to read, but we have a little plaque up there. I'm afraid I can't zoom in because I don't have fingers because it's holding the umbrella. But that's a little, uh, a little plaque for Charles Dickens. So Dickens was. Um, he's lived here the, uh, at the end of his life. He's lived in many places and he's drunk in many pubs. If you, uh, if you. If you believe that he's drunk in that many pubs, I mean, the guy would have not been that productive, you know. He's, uh, every, almost every single pub in central London, they claim that Dickens used to come. Um, but yeah, he's lived here and he was really, uh, well, not only an amazing writer, but he was really good at what we called cliff hangings, you know. It was the beginning of, um, they had just invented the steam press. So they called it the penny press, you know, that you could sell a chapter of, uh, of a novel on the street, you know, every week or, or every other week. So you'd have to have the end of the chapter very, very grabbing, you know, like the, the Netflix episodes today when you watch a show. My bicycle is still here, so we, we good. One of my colleagues just had half of the, his bicycle stolen tonight by the, by the London Eye. So, uh, so I'm good. Um, so yeah, the... Uh, other house i'm not sure which other house uh, lauren i might have caught up on the chat a bit too late so yeah dickens amazing amazing at uh, at cliff hangings and this is the lyceum theater that's where they play of course as you can see the lion king and guess what it is hunted as well the uh, the story here it came out in uh, in the late uh, 1880s they were, um, they were, there was a couple here, uh, they were sat on, you know, just a little bit above the people in front of them, like on some kind of those, like those balconies, you know, and just going to wait because it's a bit noisy. How very really good. Yeah. So they were, uh, they were sat on the lady in front of them. She had a head on her lap. Now, I know it might sound very weird, but a head, like a decapitated head, it was not attached to anybody. And that head was staring at them. And they, well, they, somehow they were not that scared. I don't know how, but they, you know, in the theater, you've got some kind of special effects and stuff. So they just looked at the head and they thought, okay, when, you know, when we come to half term, uh, or the, how do you call it, the interact. Uh, <laughs> we're not watching football, are we? So when you come to the, the little pose, they, uh, they, they thought they could run after the lady and ask her why she has a, a head on her laps. And when the time came, the lady stood up and they couldn't see the head anymore. And I thought that was it, you know, they didn't think m much of it. And um, years later, Intermission, that's the one. <laughs> Interval, yes, thank you. They, um, um, a, a few years later, they were, uh, uh, they were invited at some, uh, some big house in Yorkshire, you know, some people uh, uh, inviting them for dinner. And according to the story, at least, that, uh, that dinner, they, they spotted a portrait on the wall. And they looked at each other, they looked at the portrait, <laughs> And they were like, um, we know that head, right? And, uh, and they confronted their host. They were like, who's, who's that portrait of? Because we know that head. And the host was a bit confused because she was like, well, yeah, that's an ancestor of mine. He, he owned some of the land in, in, in between Old Witch and Covent Garden and he was beheaded for treason. So apparently they recognized the head on a portrait again. Now, uh, in that version of the story I had, it didn't state which, uh, which ancestor, but I suppose it could be the Duke of Norfolk. There was um, a, a duke that was beheaded indeed for plotting against uh, Queen Elizabeth I. He was trying to put Mary Queen of Scots on, on the throne and he did have some land around here, so it could be the one, but I don't know for sure. I, um, I love telling you those uh, ghost stories, but I have to say sometimes, I mean, in this area, I know three different ghost uh, stories with a ghost and then a portrait on the wall. So did, this, did they all uh, happen or did those stories get mixed up somehow over the years? I don't know. 
and the uh, the Christmas lights are there. They're not on yet, but they've already been uh, uh, installed. I think it's on the 11 that they'll uh, they'll light them up. So we are on a street called Strand. Most people call it this the Strand, but it's actually called Strand. It's um, it's uh, it comes from uh, Anglo-Saxon. It's uh, because at the time this was like the beach area on the, the shores. So apparently Strand in, in German it means like the, the beach area. I know I have to be careful when I say beach because um, I've been here 16 years now and I still don't know how to tell the difference between the short ease and the, and the long ease. So if I say beach I do mean the, 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 the seaside. Um, it's the same with beans and beans. You know the beans, uh, the rubbish and the beans on your toast. Uh, same with, with shit and shit. You know the shits uh, in your bed and the shit uh, from your anus. Uh, I, I honestly don't hear any difference. But yeah. Two heads are better than one, you know, yes. <laughs> anyway, let me show you the Savoy. So the Savoy is one of our iconic um, hotels in, uh, in London. And um, it was opened in late uh, Victorian times. It is the only place in London where we drive on the right hand side. You might be able to see in, out. So you come in on the right hand side and you come out. Um, officially, it's because there was the theater at the back, so the ladies on a horse carriage. Apologies, it's very noisy tonight. Ladies on a horse carriage, they could um, uh, come out from the theater and get out of the horse carriage on the right side of the street. That's the official story. But I think, I think it's just to confuse tourists. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the Savoy actually has two dark stories. The first one, it's the story of that little cat here. His name is Caspar. The, uh, let's go in there, there's another one. There was um, a, a dinner in um, 1898 where they ended up, um, well, they were meant to be 14 guests, but one didn't turn up. So they were 13 at the table. Unlucky for some, right? So they joked about it at the table. They were talking about uh, uh, the bad luck that they might get. And they said, oh, the first one, the first one to leave is going to be the first one to die. There was a politician at the table, his name was Joe Wolfe, from South Africa. And you know what? He didn't care. He stood up and left. And uh, let me show you the other Caspar and then I'm going to go because I've seen some security looking at me at the back. Um, so yeah, he stood up and left. Would you believe? A week later, he was gunned down in his office in Johannesburg. So the, uh, the Savoy was ever so sorry, of course, and they did not want that to ever, ever happen again. So they started to sit a member of staff with you. If you happen to be 13 at the table, they'll sit a, a waiter with you, which, as you can imagine, um, might, be, might be quite, uh, um, uh, uh, well, awkward. So, the um the uh, uh oops i'm gonna i'm gonna have to get my phone out my second phone bear with me so they uh, they decided to change it they commissioned an artist to do a little cat let me show you so they created casper so they would sit him at the table and um well let me show you the other one <laughs> They would literally sit him with you if you were certain at the table. So that's Caspar there at the dinner, saving everyone. Apparently, they said that Winston Churchill was very fond of Caspar the cat. So that's, um, that's the story behind, uh, behind the little bush that was cut in the, in the shape of Caspar the cat. And there's another dark story at the Savoy that was in, um, in, uh, uh, in the 1920s. It's the case of Maggie Miller, or Marguerite Alibert. She had, uh, she had uh, two names because she was a courtesan, uh, a fancy uh, sex worker. Marguerite, as you might be able to tell from the name, she was French. And in her defense, she did have a difficult 
um, upbringing. What happened is that uh, as a teenager, our little brother died. He was, um, he was run over by a lorry uh, and Margaret was there and somehow our parents blamed her for the, 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 the accident of the little boy. And they sent her to a covent and then she got out and they, they basically left her on the street. So she had, she had to feed herself, you know, and she ended up into prostitution. She met a madame that trained her into being one of the most successful uh, uh, courtesans of, of Paris. And through the, um, the First World War, there was a young soldier in the, um, I think he was in the Scots Guard, uh, a young soldier that you might, you might have heard of. He was a young um, Edward VIII. He was the Prince of Wales at the time. He was 24 at the time. And they, they, some of his entourage believed that he was not experienced enough, so uh, sexually, we mean. And uh, they introduced him to Margaret. She was much older. And um, they, began an aff they began an affair and, and, and the young prince was madly in love with Margaret for about a year. Then he got bored of her. And um, he sent her a lot of letters. Well, they did, both of them did send a lot of letters, but, but Edward was very young and he did, well, you can imagine any young, inexperienced, in love, young man, although Edward was a bit of a nasty one, but you can imagine the type of things that um, were written in those letters. He, you know, stuff like, my dad is a beep, uh, this, war, this war is stupid, and a lot of very sexual stuff. Now, those letters, we've not, uh, we've, we don't have them to, to read them, but what we do know is that much later on, Marguerite, she married uh, an Egyptian a prince, Prince Ali, and the marriage did not go well. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it, it was definitely such a bad match, but she was probably after the money. And um, one day, they were staying at the Savoy here in uh, 1923, and um, they, were, they kept fighting. Every day, there were more fights and more fights. And that night, she literally took a gun and shot him dead. There was an eyewitness, and she admitted it. And, um, uh, well, would you believe she went to court and she was acquitted? Now, you might be, you might be like, how? How could that happen? Well, um, some, believe, some believe it might have been a royal cover-up. Because what a coincidence, when that happened, young, um, the young Prince of Wales was sent to uh, Canada, not to be around. And some say that she blackmailed the royal family into, um, into protecting her, basically. So she might have said to them, I've got those horrible letters. For a normal family, that would have been okay. You know, it's just a young man writing some crap about his dad and about the royalty and about the war. But he was the Prince of Wales. So, you know, we don't know for sure because um, Marguerite went on to have a, a very long life in, in Paris. She's got some descendants and they claim that they've indeed seen those letters, but we don't know where they are in the moment. So at court, they tried to question the past of Prince Ali. They accused him of, of being immoral and, and being violent. And the past of Margaret was never checked. They were not allowed to even mention it at court. So that's how she... Um, she was acquitted. Anyway, let me show you the... Ah, sorry, I just got a massive drop. Let me show you the name here. So this is Carting Lane. Although most Londoners, or at least most tour guides, we call it Farting Lane. Because see the little lamppost in the middle? I, uh, on screen it probably looks like a gas lamp, but it's a fake one today. It used to be an actual gas lamp. they've changed most of them now so most of them are fake but this one was a special one we are here on, on the, uh, the embankment you know behind me is the river Thames and you might know what uh, what is under the embankment the public sewer Bazalgette has uh, famously created uh, the, the London sewer and would you believe at the time this very gas lamp was powered by human waste you might know human waste, it creates a gas, methane, and uh, it had to, you know, they had to, to get to let it out, you know. 
So that lamp was there um, on 24-7 to burn off the methane that was coming out of the public sewer. So that's why it's known as Farting Lane. And uh, it's quite cool. Today it's, today it's electricity, you know. But anyway, it's going to be the end of the tour. Oh my God, this is soaked. Let me show you my face again and let me know if you have any questions before we go. If not, sorry, this is very close. If you're watching me on a TV, that's probably a massive, uh, a massive face of mine. But I do want to keep the, 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 the camera dry. Thank you for coming tonight, guys. Um, have a great uh, rest of your Halloween day. Do let me know in the chat if you have any questions. And of course, uh, uh, that'll be greatly appreciated for whoever you can, if you, if you dropped a little tip or if you're going to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, with, uh, with those live tours, you know, the only money we get is straight from your generosity. So, um, well, not the only money we, you get. I probably would get ATP from YouTube, YouTube ads. But yes, so thank you very much in, uh, in advance if you are in a position to do so. And um, if you want to see a, see a bit more of me, uh, oh, Guy Fox Sunday. So we've got uh, it's already uh, it's already bonfire night. Hi Sarah, thank you, thank you Marianne. And if anyone was new to me, of course, uh, if you enjoyed uh, this little live tour, give me a, a subscribe because it's very easy to miss those tours. When you don't subscribe, you don't really see them on your, um, on your homepage. YouTube is great at promoting videos, but not so much at pro promoting the lives. Maureen is asking, do we, do, do we have kids knocking at the doors for Halloween? Um, Yes, in, in the suburbs, you know, in the, the residential area when you have like, a, a, you know, those typical Victorian streets in, in zone two or three. Yes, here in central London, no, not really. It's just, it's just not, not that it's not safe, but you know, in, in the capitals, I think it's pretty much the same all across the globe. It is just maybe a little bit risky. So no, not so much. But once you start going out, um, yeah, on the residential streets, you'll, uh, you, you might see a few of them. Although this year, I thought the uh, Halloween deco and stuff, it was all very soft. I don't know if it could be because, you know, it's a lot of plastic and, and often you, you kind of um, waste them. Someone is talking about Casper. Casper is with a K. If you're trying to Google the cat, uh, it's, uh, it's Casper with a K. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha. And uh, if anyone leaves me a little tip on, on buy me a coffee or on PayPal, uh, I know I cannot necessarily thank you uh, uh, live, but uh, make sure you know you are very, very much uh, appreciated. You've never had a color in over 30 years, Don. Oh. Yeah, it's not, it's really definitely not as, as uh, popular than, than it would be in the, in the US. No. I did that when I was living in Clapham Junction, I did have a few, um, but I suppose it's, uh, you know, kids are, are allowed to go just uh, to the neighbors, you know, they don't go, they don't go too far. But since I've left that home, I've never had where I am now in Camberwell. It's definitely not, uh, definitely not the safest area. So I don't think uh, many parents would let their kids go like that. Anyway, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to let you go. Have a great evening, a good morning, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are in the world. And hopefully I'll see some of you on Sunday for Guy Fawkes. I might even have some good weather for once. <laughs> But I remember last year in November, I had a, a series of tours. I had rain every single tour as well. So it's, uh, it's normal for the season. Anyway, see you later. Oops, see you, see you later. Bye-bye.